Would you turn, please, to John chapter 14? John 14. We want to speak tonight about the Holy Spirit. Uh, years ago, <coughs> Uh, I remember Alison, my wife, teaching Sunday school, as it was then, junior church now, but Sunday school, this is years ago. And our Nathan, our second son, he was just very small, and she taught his class. And she was trying to explain to them, to these children, about the Holy Spirit, and said, sometimes, you know, in the Bible, depends what version you use, it's the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost. And this little boy put his hand up and said, Miss... I like the Holy Ghost because it's spooky. <laughs> <laughs> Typical child, yeah. Well, of course, if you use the old King James, it was the Holy Ghost. Uh, not to create an atmosphere that's spooky, but but uh, in the ESV that we're going to read, and of course, more modern versions, it's the Holy Spirit. And I think whenever I just became a Christian, we would say that the Holy Spirit was perhaps neglected it was a neglected subject in the church of christ i think today that's changed it's perhaps the most misunderstood subject in the church of christ so hopefully tonight as we go through this uh, we'll get a little glimpse into the teaching of jesus on the night before he was crucified you would think he would choose his teaching and his words very carefully wouldn't you and he does and he gives us uh, some key <clears throat> principles to understand of the Holy Spirit. Lots more in Acts, lots more in the epistles, but Jesus boils it all down here in the upper room as he teaches about the Holy Spirit. So let's read uh, from verse 15, John 14, verse 15. If you love me, says Jesus, you'll keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world will see me no more. But you will see me because I live. You also will live. In that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. <clears throat> Judas, not Iscariot, <laughs> said to him, Lord, how is it? that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world. And Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. And the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you, but the Helper... The Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. We'll stop our reading there. And we'll make them back to the rest of the chapter next week. We'll see about that. <coughs> so reads the word of God. You remember last week we said that Jesus and John were bezies, were best friends. And John, although just a teenager, when he met Jesus, he left his father's fishing business behind. Jesus called him to follow. And basically, John had it made for the rest of his life. Because when the old man copped it, it all went to John and his brother. But John left all that behind and followed Jesus. No prospects, no fortune, but he followed Jesus. And he went on to become a leader in the early church, as we know. And he wrote five books of the Bible. He wrote three letters. 
first John, second John, third John, getting shorter all the time, yeah, his three letters. And he wrote the book of Revelation, and he wrote his gospel, and we gave you some statistics last week. If I did a test, would you remember? I don't know. I'm not testing you anyway, okay? 90% of John's gospel unique to John. If we didn't have John's gospel, we wouldn't know so much about Jesus, what he said. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But John's gospel, 90% unique to John. That's interesting, isn't it? And half his gospel deals with the last week of the life of Jesus. A fifth of his gospel, the last 24 hours, and chapters 13, 14, 15, and 16 deal with the last evening. So he's zeroing in all the time, half, a fifth, and now this little section, he deals with the upper room discourse of Jesus. And again, just to set the scene before we come to this, chapter 13, Jesus drops this huge bombshell. You remember? Three big bombshells, really. First of all, one of you will betray me. Bombshell. One of you will betray me. And we know from the other gospel records that the, the disciples suspected themselves before they suspected Judas. Lord is I. You know, nobody said, oh, Judas, we thought all along it was you. No, they didn't suspect Judas. He, he had the kit, but he wasn't in the team. And he was pretending so good that they never suspected him. But he, of course, he didn't pull the wool over Jesus' eyes. One of you will betray me. That was a bombshell. And one of you will deny me. In fact, Peter, you'll deny me, Peter. That's a huge... You know, put yourself in their sandals. That's a huge bombshell. Peter was the spokesman. Peter was going to become the leader. <laughs> yeah. And he's going to deny Christ. And then, of course, the third bombshell was, I'm going to leave you. And more than that, it's going to be a violent departure. Three massive bombshells and the reaction of the disciples is one of desperation one of devastation they're completely distraught in fact as we come into chapter 14 the word that's used is they were troubled their hearts were troubled jesus puts his finger in that verse 1 of chapter 14 let not your hearts be troubled why because their hearts were troubled and again we find that to be the case uh, let me see the end of verse 27. Their hearts are troubled. And it's a very strong word. I guess, you know, we're troubled about something, yeah. We, we understand the strength of it. But in the original Greek, it's really, really strong. In fact, they're grief-stricken. They're being crushed. So much so, we sang about Gethsemane, didn't we? In Gethsemane, it says this, that Jesus was troubled in his spirit and he went on to pray my soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death and he sweat great drops of blood so that tells you the strength of the war doesn't it they were troubled grief stricken and we know don't we that whenever we're in grief i know this pastorally whenever we're in grief grief has various stages and one of the stages is questioning lots of questions why questions well they're in grief, they're grief-stricken, and there's an unspoken question. Here's the question. How will we cope when Jesus leaves? That's the question. And of course, that's a key question in bereavement, isn't it? How will I cope on my own? And that's what the disciples want to know. How are we going to cope? They feel alone. In fact, verse 18, they feel like orphans. That's the word Jesus uses. They feel like orphans. And that's what Jesus begins to address here. That's what he begins to deal with from verse 16. I planned, I provided for that too. <laughs> and that plan, that provision, centers around the coming of the Holy Spirit. And of course we know, if you know the Upper Room Discourse, that repeatedly in the upper room discourse, Jesus speaks about the Holy Spirit. The end of 
uh, chapter 15 again, the beginning of chapter 16, and here in the little section that we have looked at uh, tonight, or read tonight. Jesus teaches about the Holy Spirit constantly in the upper room. Why? Because his ministry is the answer to their great sense of loss. His ministry is the answer to their great sense of loss. So that's all by way of introduction. We want to think about the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost tonight. Three questions. Who, what, and how? Can't get any more simple than that, can we? Who, what, and how? Who? Who is the Holy Spirit? Well, Jesus introduces the theme, verses 16 and 17. Here's what he says. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him. And he dwells with you and will be in you. Who is the Holy Spirit? Well, did you notice? I tried to emphasize it as we read it. First of all, the Holy Spirit is a person. He, him, him, he, not it, not it. Jesus uses the personal pronoun. Why? Because he's a person, not a power. He is powerful, but he's not a power, not a force, not an influence, but a person. He. Every time the Holy Spirit is spoken about, he is referred to as he. That's important. Elsewhere, uh, the Bible speaks about the Holy Spirit being grieved. So Paul writes to the Ephesian Christians and he says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit whereby you're sealed to the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you. Because that's how you grieve the Holy Spirit. But the point is this. You can't grieve a force. Or an influence. You can only grieve a person. Yeah? The Holy Spirit is a person. Elsewhere, we find in the book of Acts, I think it's chapter 5, the Holy Spirit can be lied to. The Holy Spirit can be sinned against. It's the story of Ananias and Sapphira, you remember? They lie to the Holy Spirit. They sin against the Holy Spirit. You can't lie to a force or an influence, a fog, no. You can't sin against a force or an influence, but you can lie to, you can sin against a person. So that's the first thing. Just lying on the surface, who is the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is a person, not a thing, but a person, not a net but a he, not a powerful influence av available for me to use, but a person who wants me to be available for him to use. A person. Who is the Holy Spirit? Secondly, he's a divine person. We're Trinitarians, aren't we? We believe in God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And as we read through this little chapter here, Jesus is speaking and we go back and forth from the Father to Jesus, to the Father, to the Holy Spirit, to Jesus. Did you get that when we read it? It just goes back and forth. We can't separate the members of the Godhead from each other. Yes, they are distinct persons, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. And yet, notice please the language Jesus uses, verse 17. He says, the Spirit will be in you. Verse 17. Verse 20. I will be in you. And then verse 23. We will be in you. Spirit, I, and we. And unless we recognize that the Holy Spirit is God, 
divine, then that's completely confusing, isn't it? The Holy Spirit is God living in us. He's called elsewhere in the New Testament the Spirit of Christ. Yeah? We recognize the deity of Christ and equally recognize the deity of the Holy Spirit. In fact, in that passage I mentioned earlier on, Acts chapter 5, Peter says to Ananias and Sapphira, in lying to the Holy Spirit, you've lied to God. So who is the Holy Spirit? I've added a few more references from elsewhere in the New Testament, but basically lying on the surface of this passage, two things. The Holy Spirit is a person, not an it, a he, a him. And the Holy Spirit is a divine person. Jesus wants his disciples to get that. Just before he goes, if you forget everything else, get this. Secondly, what? What does the Holy Spirit do? Well, I think the different names that are given to him here help us to understand what he does. He's called, maybe your version says, counsellor or comforter or helper. The word in the original means someone who comes alongside. Someone who draws alongside. In fact, the Greek word means advocate, a legal helper, someone who stands right beside you in a court, that kind of helper, that kind of <coughs> counsellor. And generally in the New Testament, the word is also translated a friend. So let's put all that together. What does he do? He helps us. He draws alongside to help. He counsels us. He comforts us. And he's a friend. And the context, they feel like orphans. They feel alone. Jesus says the Holy Spirit will be your friend. Your friend. You won't be alone because you'll have him. And again, we spoke about grief a second ago. When you're grief-stricken, you want someone just to be there with you, don't you? Not to say too much. If you're with someone who's grieving, please, please, don't say too much. There's the ministry of presence, just being there. Weeping with the one who weeps. Well, here, these disciples need to hear that. They feel like orphans, they are grief-stricken. Someone will come and he'll just be there. He'll meet you at the point of your need. And he'll not just be there for a while. Jesus was with them for three years. He's not going to be with you for three years and counting, no. Jesus was with them for about a thousand days. This one who's going to come, this helper, he's not going to be there for a thousand days, no. The last part of verse 16, he'll be with you forever. He'll be your constant companion. Now, can I pause there? Press the pause button. Let me give you a little bit of biblical theology here. In the Old Testament, we read about the Holy Spirit. And what we find is this, the Holy Spirit came upon certain people, God's people, for a particular task. When that task was finished, the Holy Spirit left. So, for example, Samson. You read the story of Samson in the book of Judges, you'll find the Holy Spirit came upon him to take on the Philistines. Yeah? And then left. The Holy Spirit came upon him again for a particular task. We read that about several of the judges. The prophets as well, the Holy Spirit came upon them as they were preaching and prophesying and then left. So maybe that will help you to make sense of David when he's praying in Psalm 51 and he says, 
take not your Holy Spirit from me. You ever wonder what that meant? It's because it's the Old Testament. The Spirit came and went and came and went. And he's wanting the Spirit to come and stay for a little while with him. So that's the Old Testament. But what we find is, when we come into the New Testament, that all changes. That all changes. Post-Pentecost, the Spirit is going to come and be with the people of God forever. Not leave, not come and go. Yes, we can grieve him, absolutely. But he comes and he stays. Now, we've talked about helper. He's going to come and stay, that constant helper. Uh, let me just try and unpack for you another little word here, because every word of the Bible is significant, okay? Verse 16, Jesus says, another helper. So not just a helper, but another helper. And in Greek, there are two terms for the word another. One of these terms means another of a different kind. And then there's another word for another. <laughs> and it means another of the same kind. Exactly the same. So, Will gives me a book, okay? And uh, I lose the book and I say to him, don't worry. I've got another book in my study. I'll give you that. What would he say? He said, I, don't, I want the book that I gave you. I don't want just a book. I want a specific book. So this book here is a book of a different kind. But he wants the exact same book. And I go on Amazon and order it. Same title, same cover, same author. That's another of the same kind. See the difference? Another of a different kind another of the same kind. I wonder what word Jesus uses here when he uses the word another. He uses another of the same kind. Just as Jesus was with them to help them. Just as Jesus was with them to comfort them. Just as Jesus was with them to counsel them. The Holy Spirit will be with them forever to do the same. So see how it's building up here. But what does the Holy Spirit do? Well, he'll help them. He'll come and be with them. He'll come and be with them forever. And he'll do exactly for them what Jesus did for them. Another of the same. And then one more thing. Would you notice it builds he'll be with them? He'll be with them forever. And then notice verse 17, this little phrase, would you? Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him for he dwells with you. And here it is. And will be in you. See how it builds? The spirit will be with you. The spirit will be with you forever. And now the Spirit will be in you. That fits, doesn't it, with the Apostle Paul speaking to the Corinthians and saying, do you not know that you are the temple, the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit? You're bought with a price, the price of blood. And here Jesus makes this promise. He'll be with you. That's great, isn't it? He'll be with you forever. Well, that's better but he will be in you. You will be the house of God. Can I tell you, this isn't the house of God. This isn't the house of God. This is a building. You could sell this building and it could be used for multiple, multiple things, yeah? Do you know who the house of God is? You are the house of God. You're the dwelling place of God. You are the temple of of the Holy Spirit. How wonderful is that?
And then also, trying to build this a little bit more, also would you notice the Holy Spirit is called the instructor or the teacher. This comes out, I think, in verse 25 and 26. These things I have spoken to you while I'm still with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I've said to you. Now, who's Jesus speaking to here? He's speaking to the disciples. So when he says you, he's speaking to them, primarily to them. So, yeah, in a general way, we can say, well, the Holy Spirit will bring to my mind all that he wants me to say. But actually, that's not what it's saying. The Holy Spirit will help me. But he's speaking to them, to the disciples. I'll bring to remembrance all that I've said to you. I'll remind you, I'll teach you all things. Now, what's the meaning here? What's he meaning here? Well, I think it's a, a reference to inspiration. Because these disciples are going to go on and they're going to write the Gospels. And the Holy Spirit is going to inspire them to write the Gospels. The Holy Spirit will remind them all that Jesus said. So we can read the Gospels with confidence. They weren't relying on their memory. The Holy Spirit came and reminded them of all that Jesus taught them. And they wrote it down. The inspiration of the Gospels. And then I think it's also, uh, we find if we compare it with uh, chapter 16. Would you come over to chapter 16 for a second? And verse 12, I think it is. Chapter 16, verse 12. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatsoever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. So I think chapter 14, he's referring to the Gospels, the inspiration of the Gospels. The spirit will come and bring to all your remembrance all that I taught you and they wrote it down in the Gospels but there's some things that you can't bear just now you can't cope with just now but when the Spirit comes he will help you to write down the epistles <laughs> and we know that don't we the disciples were on this journey the you know it was one step forward two steps back we think of Peter even in the book of Acts you remember when he had this vision about the unclean animals and he doesn't get it, he doesn't want to obey and there's got to be, God's got to take severe steps with them to get them to go to the Gentiles. So they weren't able to bear these things when Jesus was with them. Later on, they did get it. And Peter's writing the epistles. And Paul, he's writing the epistles. John's writing the epistles. Jude's writing his epistle as well. They've got it then. So I think what Jesus is speaking about here is the Holy Spirit will be the teacher. He'll be the instructor. He will come and he will help you to remember what I taught you. And he'll write the gospel. And then he'll bring the things that you're not able to bear just now. He'll teach you those things and you'll be able to write the epistles. Now, that's helpful to me because we read the whole New Testament and we have this divine stamp of inspiration. God breathed Gospels and all the epistles inspired by the Holy Spirit. And Jesus here in the upper room is promising that that will happen. I'm leaving you, but the Spirit will come. And what will he do? He will remind you. He will teach you and enable you to write the Bible. <laughs> so who, who is the Holy Spirit? According to Jesus here, he's a person, not an it, but a he and a him person and he is a divine person and what does he do well he helps us 
He counsels us. He comforts us. He will be with us. He'll be with us forever. He'll come and dwell within us. We will be the temple of the Holy Spirit. And he will teach the apostles. And he will bring to the remembrance what they need to write down by way of inspiration. Now, the secondary application is when we come to the Bible, we are to ask for the help of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, because he will teach us. I think primarily it's to the apostles for inspiration of the New Testament. The third question, and with this we'll finish, how, who, what, how? How do we experience the Holy Spirit? I don't know if you noticed it, but there's a little thread that runs the whole way through this chapter. You can't escape it. How do we experience the Holy Spirit? Let me give you some verses. Verse 15 and 16. See if you get it. The thread. Okay. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Verse 21. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father and I will love him and man manifest myself to him. And verse 23, have you seen it? Here it is again, verse 23. Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. See the thread? Loving Jesus and obeying Jesus. That's how we experience the presence of the Holy Spirit. Loving Jesus and obeying Jesus. That thread is woven right into the, the whole passage. If you love me, keep my commandments. Keep my commandments, we will come to you. Keep my word and we will come to you and make our abode, make our home in you. Now, as I said earlier, lots more that we could learn about the Holy Spirit because when the Holy Spirit himself was teaching the apostles, they wrote down so much about the doctrine of the Holy Spirit in the epistles. But here we are in the upper room. Jesus wants his disciples to get the gist of it. He chooses his words carefully and he wants them to understand who the Holy Spirit is what the Holy Spirit does and how they can experience the presence of the Holy Spirit. It was for them and I think it's for us as well. Yeah. This week, when you're living your Christian life, be overwhelmed by this. God, the Holy Spirit, is living in you, believer. He wants to work through you, believer. He wants you to take his word and read it with an expectant heart, believing that it's inspired by him. And above all else, ask the Holy Spirit to cultivate within your heart a love for Jesus and a desire to obey him. You might know more of his presence is that is that helpful it's not a neglected subject it's a misunderstood subject yet but jesus boils it all down <coughs> the who the what and the how of the holy spirit next week we'll come back and god willing i think what we'll do is we'll maybe jump to chapter 15 where jesus compares himself to the true vine and how we abide in him and then the role of the Father in pruning the vine to cultivate more growth within us. He wants the disciples to get that because they're going to be suffering persecution soon. The world will hate you, says Jesus, as it hated me. And you need to understand that God will even use all the suffering to prune them and to cause them to run to him and abide in him even more closely. Let's pray together. 
Father. We thank you for the Holy Spirit. We thank you that the Holy Spirit brought us to spiritual life. We were dead. We were quickened by the Spirit of truth. Your word tells us that. He opened our eyes. He softened our hearts. He imparted life. He pointed us to Christ. He revealed Christ to us. Convicted us of sin, of righteousness and judgment to come. And your Holy Spirit imparted faith to us. We give all the credit to your Holy Spirit's involvement in our salvation. And we thank you that we have your word, the <coughs> Spirit-inspired word, to guide us through life. <coughs> We have the power of your Spirit to help us to witness. And we need your Holy Spirit, Lord, because we can't do it ourselves. We're, we're cowards. But, Lord, you see in the book of Acts, the believers were bold as they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Fill us with the Holy Spirit. Under the control of the Holy Spirit, that we might be bold in presenting the gospel to our family and friends. Please. And Lord, we need his comfort. There be some here tonight having lost loved ones. Comfort them by your spirit, please. When we feel alone, remind us that he is with us. We're never alone. He is the instructor. He's the teacher. He's the guide. <coughs> And Lord, we will get into conversations and we don't know where we're going to go, but Lord, help us, teach us. And most of all, teach us about Christ. We know that primarily that's the Holy Spirit's role, to teach us about Christ, to make much of Christ, and we pray to that end. Please. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.